So good evening and welcome to the August 13, 2015 version of the Commissioner Tools Virtual Forum. My name is Rick Hillenbrand and our guest presenters tonight will be myself and Larry Chase. Assisting we have uh, Deborah Kendrew. Our format tonight is we're going to uh, have two uh, presentations to begin, why all the changes and one on the unit service plan and we're going to reserve our last 15 minutes for your questions and answers. If we get done with the presentations a little earlier, we'll start the Q&A a little earlier as well. So with that, Deborah, if we could go to why all the changes and uh, let's go to our next slide. So that visual is uh, what some have described kind of like a little bit of a spaghetti mixing bowl approach to what we have looked like in the past with regards to the things commissioners did. It was a hodgepodge of everything going every which direction and uh, not very orderly and not very streamlined. Um, uh, Deborah, if you go to our next slide. Uh, if you think back a few years ago, the Commissioner Field Book had uh, 16 items at the high level for us to do as commissioners and if you counted all the sub items because there were two or three, sometimes even four sub items under those 16, some folks would count as high as 37 items that commissioners were supposed to do and we're supposed to of course be experts at every one of those things and uh, while we were doing everything it wasn't perhaps appropriate for us to be doing everything but the districts had commissioners doing trends of scouting presentations not because they wanted to but because it was an assignment. We were doing membership rallies and district activities, uh, camperies and as the words say their list went on and on and on. And at that time, you may recall that if you needed to get data on your unit, you would do something like ask your district executive or some other professional for a field sheet or something along those lines, and you would get that information from them sometimes days later. Those uh, other documents that we would use include things such as uh, progress reports and DTRs and OPRs and MMRs, separated leader lists, and on and on and on. And that, of course, made our lives uh, that much more complicated with regards to trying to do the things that we as commissioners do. Now, on top of all that, if we go to our next slide, please, we we're also doing assessments, all different types of assessments. And there was no continuity between the assessments. We had unit self-assessments, commissioner unit assessments, commissioner worksheets for PACs, troops, ships, and crews, and commissioner self-assessment uh, as well. Um, all that stuff, by the way, is nice historical information, but you can now take that all and push that to the side. It might be good to look at from time to time, but hopefully you'll in the future only see that uh, in a museum because uh, that stuff uh, we have kind of streamlined. And uh, one of the other big things that was not done when we were doing these assessments were we were doing assessments, but we weren't coming up with this thing called an actionable item. And that's something that Larry will talk a whole lot more about in his presentation. But those were things that we were doing and what we were trying to do was we were looking for responsibility and accountability but we really didn't have any way to monitor that, assign that or anything else along those lines. Now one of the things that did happen over the last, well it was about eight years ago, was we started to get electronic with regards to our tracking our contacts, we then called them visits to our units, and we deployed something that was basically a glorified Excel spreadsheet called Unit Visitation Tracking System. Um, while not as robust as what we have today, Unit Visitation Tracking System certainly did tell us that we had a lot of progress and opportunity ahead of us if we wanted to meet with each of our units as we thought we were if you recall from your commissioner of basic training, the theory was that we would be meeting with all our units at least once a month. And as we learned early on through the unit visitation tracking system, we weren't coming very close to that at all. So if we go to our next slide, thank you. About three years ago, the uh, national leadership under Tico Perez and the rest of the national support team came up with a simplified approach of four things that we wanted the commissioners to do under our mission of unit service. 
And those are listed right there on the page. And hopefully this is something that you have seen over and over and over again because this is multiple years old. So I'm not going to read through them, but those have been the things that we have been working on over the last several years that have been our focus with regards to what is it we're trying to do. And in fact, I would refer to that at times. When somebody asked me as a commissioner, hey, would you mind doing an FOS presentation? You know, I'd look down through that list and say, okay, where does it fit in one, two, three, or four? Now, sometimes some of these things actually can support, including, say, an FOS presentation. If in your mind it supports unit growth through the journey to excellence and those types of things, and, you know, okay. But for the most part, this really does help us with laser-like um, accuracy, if you would, try to keep ourselves on track with regards to our mission service. And again, this is several years old. Now the key concept, if we go to the next slide, please, for our mission service are impact and unit retention. And uh, this is what we're all about. The um, uh, important things that we've got here is that uh, we want to know that our commissioners are actually delivering quality programs to our units. And that um, you may recall over this past year, we've changed one of our other concepts. We've gone from this process of, you know, we had a ratio that we pretty much ironclad tried to achieve, which was no more than three units assigned per commissioner. Now we're looking more at the impact that commissioners make. You know, what is the quality of the product being delivered? In some cases, a one-to-one -one ratio is much more appropriate. If you've got a whole bunch of easy units, maybe you can do five. So that three-to-one ratio isn't quite so as important. Um, unit retention, that's obviously our single biggest indicator that we're being successful. And secondly, we'll see that uh, we get increased retention in our new units. And that's one of those things that uh, helps with our membership growth. In fact, we've been very successful in those areas. But these are some of our key concepts that we're all about. So uh, I'm going to interrupt you with a question, which I think this is, if you don't mind, this is an appropriate yeah. time to actually ask it because sure. you might want to, since we're on this particular concept, to talk to it. And, and the question is, how are these concepts and those four key areas you just covered that commissioners are now being asked to handle specifically, how are those being relayed to unit leaders, to district committee folks, to the professionals? How are we as commissioners making that known to others? You know, you know that's a great question because I think that's an ever-ending process because there's always turnover in that crowd. So no matter how often this information is published and what various forms it's been put out there, uh, there's always going to be a constant new guy or gal on the block that needs to hear this information. So while this training should be uh, transmitted through the basic training that you get as a, a new scouter, I think that one of the best ways we can do that is as a commissioner make sure that as we work with our units, we in an appropriate fashion, let them know, here are the four things that I'm trying to do as a commissioner with regards to providing you a simple and unified service, and those four items are just as we saw on the last slide. So um, there, there's certainly a lot of this stuff is published, uh, Deborah, uh, but it is probably not stuff that people would routinely go to unless they were a commissioner. So. I think the onus is on the commissioners to make sure their unit leaders are uh, aware of that information. Thank you. That, I was going to ask, does that answer your question for you? Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay. So, um, some of our other key concepts here is uh, the things that we're measuring, and we needed to make sure that our metrics were assessing impact. You know, you got to be careful sometimes of. Uh, what you're measuring, are you measuring the right thing in order to figure out what you're trying to do? So, you know, if, if you're you know, looking at the tank, you know, how much fuel do you have in your gas tank, that's not telling you how fast you're going. It may be related, but it's not telling you how fast you're going. You need to look at your speedometer to see how fast you're going. Uh, that type of an example. Now, uh, an additional 
key concept here is, you know, we went into our second century over the last several years, and the mission of unit service um, has become uh, more important than ever. It's actually unchanged, but it's more important than ever. But the tools that we're using, that has changed, and we have adapted, and uh, we will continue to adapt to uh, the new, the second century, if you would, in order to remain relevant, use the technology that's available, and ensure that we're getting the impact that we're, we're seeking with regards to our mission there of unit service. So the tools that we're using today, and hopefully these are things that are, you're familiar with, significantly through the MyDot Scouting Suite would include things such as uh, training manager, member manager, and of course, commissioner tools. And then we have opportunities such as reports that allow us to go look at information on a self-serve basis, such as unassigned units, units that need help, priority units, if you would, uh, youth retention, unit retention, uh, training advancement, all those types of things which are available to us through the technology that's out there. Admittedly, not all of that is directly accessible immediately and directly through Commissioner Tools. So um, if we look at our next slide, we'll see that the characteristics of our second century service and scouting are actually pretty common, especially if you're in corporate America, you'll see that this is mirroring what you find in an awful lot of industries out there. You know, we're looking at visioning, continuous improvement, engagement, collaboration, linkage, and transparency. That's what we're trying to do, and uh, I think that's very uh, current with regards to what you see out there in corporate America today. Now, the next slide to ask the important questions of how do we get there, and that goes back to part of an earlier conversation with regards to our commissioner ratios. But the first part is we need to make sure we recruit sufficient commissioners to provide that quality service. And it may not be a three to one ratio. You need to factor in things such as new units and those types of things. That's not to say, of course, that the training that you received in the past isn't applicable. It's a good format to give you a notional organizational chart. So if you go out there and you have notionally we'll say 30 units and you divide by three, you should say immediately, I need at least 10 commissioners serving those 30 units, and that's not counting the administrative business. So if you only have, say, three or four commissioners, you know you got to get busy recruiting. And recruiting is continuous. There's, there's constant churn in your commissioner base. We know that commissioners come and go for any number of reasons. They move, they get tired of scouting. Sometimes even they go home to the, uh, you know, wood badge course in the sky. Um, other things that we need to do is we need to um, continue our commissioner training, and we are working hard to keep our training materials up to date. If you're not aware of it, all the training materials that have been put together for commissioner colleges was updated uh, in this past several months, and it's all available on the website. And uh, we continue to try to keep that stuff evergreen, if you would, and refreshed on a constant basis. And then we have, again, the simplified unit service plan that uh, Gary's, um, I'm sorry, not Gary, Larry is going to talk about a little bit later here. So, um, here go to the next slide. Thank you. So, things that we've got right now, commissioner tools, the other ones that I've talked of in my scouting, we now use a term called a collaborative assessment. And this is where we go and we use that term of the key three with regards to con the concept of teamwork. We want to work with your unit leaders, which are your scoutmaster, pubmaster, coach, skipper, whatever, your committee chair, and your charter organization rep for your unit in order to perform that assessment in, a, in an environment that is friendly and collaborative where we work together. We use documents such as a unit performance guide, helps us form new units and do it in a positive way that uh, increases the likelihood that the units are going to be successful and actually will be there several years down the road. And uh, already we've got data that the unit performance guide process works successfully. The unit key three we've already talked about there. And um, we're uh, planning right now, this is under Darlene's cognizance, we're going to be updating our commissioner manuals uh, this year. We hope to have that done by December. And uh, Larry may have a moment or two. He's also working on 
uh, recognition changes for commissioner service. Now, I will tell you, we already have some new recognitions out there, such as the Exceptional Commissioner Service uh, Award. So um, that's already there. So our goals, if we go to our next slide, are simplified there, all three, unit retention, unit contacts, and unit performance. And you'll note that it's all tied together uh, through journey to excellence there. If we could, let's go to our uh, last slide, and this will be my jumping off point to uh, hand this over to uh, Larry. So once we get this all accomplished, hopefully that uh, uh, tangled mess of uh, that interchange that you saw in the beginning, uh, that goes away, and we've got a much more streamlined approach. Looks like that nice uh, clover leaf there that uh, gives us our mission, our uh, direction, and it's uh, not such a tangled mess that goes in all different directions and uh, makes it difficult to uh, achieve what we're trying to go do. Now, with that, what I'd like to do is uh, take a moment and let uh, Deborah uh, turn the reins over to Larry. Well, I appreciate everybody being online with us this evening, and it's good to have a chance to talk with you. Let's spend a few minutes and try to go down in a little bit more detail on some of the points that Rick covered and then have some time for questions and answers if there are some things folks would like to talk about. Um, when, when we talk about the unit service plan, I think there, there are some things that come to mind to me when I, when I get into this conversation. And one of the first things is that I believe that BP had it right. He had a vision. And his vision fundamentally was that if we played this game with a purpose with kids, that we would build better communities and a better nation and ultimately a better world. And I think that vision still holds true for us in, in scouting second century. Um, Rick talked about impact, and I believe that unit service fundamentally is an impact game that if we're effective in what we do in our work with our units, that those units are going to serve more kids better through scouting. And as a result, we're having a significant impact through our work as commissioners. I also believe it's impossible to push a rope, and that's important when we talk about the unit service plan, but we'll get back to that. So if you could go to the next slide, Deborah, and it probably is going to take two clicks. No, there we go. Okay. Um, one of my favorite graphics in scouting, and I think most of our commissioners have a job that shares something in common with Alice, is she traveled through Wonderland. And everybody's probably familiar with the story that she came to a fork in the road, and it was there that she encountered the Cheshire Cat. And her conversation with the cat may sound a little bit like some of the conversations that we get into with unit leaders from time to time, because if you'll remember, the conversation went something like this. Alice saying, Cheshire, push, push. Would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? And the cat replies, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. And Alice says, I really don't much care. And the cat's advice is, well, then it doesn't matter which way you go. And Alice then says, so long as I get somewhere, and the cat says, oh, you're sure to do that if you only walk long enough. Well, the job of our commissioners is to serve kids, and as a practical matter, commissioners don't have time to wander aimlessly and try to figure out which turn they ought to take and which way they ought to go. That really doesn't help them get to where they're trying to get to and have impact. Mr. Webster is a friend of mine, and he tells me that an assessment is an appraisal that it's a classification of someone or something with respect to its worth. And he also tells me that it's a judgment. It's the act of judging or assessing a situation or an event. Now, if you stop and think about it, we teach assessment everywhere in scouting, from guiding our scouts to engage in thorns and roses at the end of a day on a film op trek to teaching our unit leaders to complete a unit self-assessment. And it's in virtually every training that we offer to our kids and to our leaders. But too often there's a problem, and Rick touched upon this. If you think about it, we've got unit assessments, we've got commissioner assessments, we've got unit health assessments. 
that are required by the membership validation process. And if, if you think about it for very long, you start to come to the conclusion that everybody is assessing our units in some form or fashion, but it also seems that none of that information is being shared. As a result, none of those assessments have very much impact. They're, they're uncoordinated. So at the end of the day, if unit service is an impact game, and I really do believe it is, then we've got to find a way to have a more positive impact in what we do in assessing units. If you'd flip the slide for me, Deb. So this is a graphic that probably is familiar to a lot of people. It's one that represents the four basic elements of a unit service plan the assessment, the plan itself, engaging the district operating committee to get commitment to support the plan and implementation. And that original graphic now carries the logo for Commissioner Tools because Commissioner Tools is the vehicle that we use to complete all four of the elements of the unit service plan. And obviously, all of it is centered upon the units. There's probably a misleading concept about the unit service plan. I think a lot of people tend to immediately think that it's all about JTE, and in fact, it isn't. Um, JTE is an absolutely wonderful tool that does a great job of helping us determine where we've been, what we've accomplished, and one good way to think about JTE is to consider it to be something like a rearview mirror in our cars. Um, it, it does give us a great picture of where we've been. It's a tool that we can use to make mid-course corrections, but it fundamentally is retrospective. It's, it's telling us what we've accomplished. It's telling us where we've been. The unit service plan, on the other hand, is much more like a GPS. It gives us the path, it gives us the course for where we want to go, where we want our units to, to be. Um, it's a way to avoid debate because it is collaborative in its structure and also avoids debate, allows our commissioners to avoid getting into debate with unit leaders who may not be particularly concerned about gold and silver and bronze and, and getting engaged in record keeping that is required for participation in JTE, um, it takes all that debate off the table because the unit service plan doesn't talk about JTE specifically. It's not about gold, it's not about silver, and it's not about bronze, it's about improvement. And if you've had an opportunity to, to, to work through the various um, uh, assessment tools, the simple assessment and, and the detailed assessment functions that are in Commissioner Tools, you found that there's only one place in all of them that you'll find the letters J, T, and E together capitalized, and there's only one place in the entire application that you'll find gold and silver and bronze. And there is one question in the last section of a detailed assessment where a commissioner can indicate what level of JTE the unit is striving to achieve, gold, silver, or bronze, but there's also a fourth answer to that question that can, be, that can be given, which is no level being sought by the unit. So one of the intentional design points of the unit service plan, and that rolls over into uh, commissioner tools, is while it enables success with JTE, that first area of focus that Rick talked about for commissioners, it's not obvious in that focus because we don't talk in JTE terms. But Larry, I'm going to interrupt you for just a minute and ask sure. a question. And this is a question that we are getting frequently. And so I think it's important that perhaps we address it here tonight. And that question is, um, about the fact that we're interfacing our assessments or our, our counts into JTE. Mm -hmm. And 
Um, should we be worrying about whether we have that specific recommendation about one detailed assessment for every unit and and six, five or six, um, and maybe you can clarify for us, five or six simple assessments. What is the recommendation for how many um, as contacts are being made a year for a unit? So if we look at the JTE goals for districts and for councils for unit service, we will find that there is a standard there for unit contacts. And I don't have the sheet in front of me right at the moment. I believe it calls for at least one detailed assessment. And I believe it calls for I think it's five simples and one detail. Five, yeah, I think it's five. I think it's five other meaningful contacts. It doesn't say simple assessment. Right. It calls. It calls for one detailed assessment, and then I think I believe it calls for five other meaningful contacts. Um, and a couple of couple of points on that. Meaningful contact is intended to mean a contact with the unit that furthers the unit service plan that moves the unit further along its journey to excellence. Um, it need not be a visit in person. It can be uh, a telephone exchange. It can be an email or a series of emails. Um, it need not be a visit to a unit event. It may be a cup of coffee someplace with one or more unit leaders. But it's a meaningful contact that actually moves the unit forward in its journey to, success, uh, journey to excellence. Um, if, if you've looked at the elements of the detailed assessment function in Commissioner Tools, although we don't speak specifically in JTE language, you will quickly see that the four areas, the four, four major segments of the detailed assessment are the goal areas in JTE for a unit. Um, things like uh, membership and things like program and things like uh, leadership um, and planning and budgeting. Um, and then within each one of those, when you look at the specific goal areas, those are the specific JTE uh, goal areas for the type of unit that, that you're talking about, whether it's a pack or a crew or a ship or, or a team. So. The, the intent and the design of the unit service plan and commissioner tools, again, was to take the focus off of JTE as a specific concept. And rather than asking unit leaders what level of JTE do you want to attain in a given area, putting the question in terms of, well, do you think that your kids ought to be camping? And most leaders will readily agree that that's a great thing to be doing with the kids. And then the conversation can be, well, how's our camping program doing, both our short-term camping program, our long-term camping program? And if we think it's great, fine. And if we think there are things we can do to approve it, then we can talk about that. So if we work the unit service plan as it's architected um, in commissioner tools, we ultimately will find that the journey to excellence will take care of itself because we are working the elements of JTE. We just don't use that terminology. Does all of that close the loop on your question, Deb, about JTE and how it fits with what we're doing in, in, in Commissioner Tools? Yes. And um, well, Bob has given us a few uh, additional pointers that I'll go ahead and um, let people know that the bronze requirement is that 10% of the units have the six total assessments, including one being a detailed. And uh, if you are trying to achieve a silver, uh, that is 20% of your units, and gold, 35% of your units. But also, I do want to make one more point, Larry. In working um, to build the tool, one thing that we did was we changed the time frame from when folks could enter their, what used to be a visit, and they used to be able to do it for the whole year. And we changed that time frame and we limited it to only 
um, 60, 90 days out, depending on whether you're doing a, um, a round table contact or you're doing an assessment. And can you speak to why we put those limitations in? Because the intent was to encourage the interaction and the, the active engagement of the commissioner with the unit rather than scurrying at the end of the year to enter a bunch of visits in UBTS or in Commissioner Tools for that matter to meet a JTE standard for a district or for a council. The focus once again is on serving the unit and on helping the unit progress on its own journey to excellence, on its own journey for improvement rather than on achieving um, a, a JTE standard for unit service by a district or by a council. This is Rick. If I could add, if I could add one other item, uh, part of that also is timeliness of the information. When there's no threshold for when does this information die or get stale, people make entries sometimes 10 months after the fact, and that's not timely. So 60 days really kind of pushes the emphasis with regards to making sure you share information in a timely fashion. Absolutely correct, and it also enables us to see in a timely fashion how the plan is developing and how the plan is being worked. So the whole focus is more on having actionable information and having an impact upon the unit rather than strictly upon record keeping. Okay. Um, the plan causes a significant change in culture um, in the way that our commissioners work. It, as a practical matter, is a way for us to end the, the concept of district police that some people have had um, about commissioners over the years. Um, I suspect a lot of unit leaders, even though we encouraged our commissioners not to take notepads and clipboards into meetings, a lot of unit leaders knew that we were doing some sort of assessing, some sort of reporting as a result of our visits, and the unit service plan takes that all out in the open because now we're working collaboratively with our unit leaders to complete the assessment, to develop the plan, and we're working together with them to move the unit forward in those areas that, that we think will have the greatest impact on the program that we deliver to the kids. Um, the collaborative assessment has to be based upon a good working relationship with unit leaders. We're not going to be very successful as commissioners um, developing a collaborative assessment if we haven't built a trust-based relationship with those unit leaders where we can share openly our thoughts. Um, the new service plan concept replaces the old annual service plan, which, if you think about it very long, doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it told every commissioner that they ought to do these two things in January, these three things in February, these four things in March, these two things in April, and so on and so forth through the year. And by the, ten, by the time they got to the end of December, a diligent commissioner would have completed every item on that task list and unfortunately might not have had any real impact upon the unit because that task list was generic and might not have addressed the specific needs of the unit being served. So. It's a significant shift from the, the, the annual service plan concept in that it's customized and focused specifically on the needs of the unit. It ends having commissioners in a position of trying to push a rope where they're working an agenda of what they think is important for the unit in the old model, but not having had open discussion and worked collaboratively with the unit leaders and developed a plan together they may be trying to move the unit leaders in a direction and move the unit in a direction that the unit, that the unit leaders haven't bought into because there hasn't been that collaboration, that discussion. Um, it, it takes the unit commissioner out of the position of trying to be um, an expert in everything and positions them in a role that I think is, is reflective of how we want them functioning more as general practitioners in medical terms rather than as a specialist. Um, their, their primary goal is to assess unit strengths and needs and to build the plan and make sure the plan get works, gets worked effectively, 
rather than try to do all those things themselves. And that brings us to this concept of sometimes they'll need subject matter expertise that may well be resident among members of the district committee and part of the role of the unit commissioner when those needs are identified is perhaps to go to the district committee. Um, they may have a unit that wants to do backpacking and doesn't have a leader that is comfortable doing that, is familiar with it, and they could go to the district committee, to the camping committee, and get assistance in identifying another unit in the district that is strong in that area that more than likely would be willing to come in and help a unit train itself up um, to do that kind of, of activity with its, with its kids. So that whole concept of linkage with district committee resources is key to what we're trying to do. Um, again, it's focused on unit needs. It gives us a method to ensure that we're putting actionable information in the commissioner tools. And it also gives us a mechanism to ensure that our units are continually improving, which ultimately is what JTE is all about. Um, it enables us to, to focus on two areas that are particularly important, we believe. Um, one is new units. And even today, if we look at how we do at retaining new units after 36 months, our performance is not particularly good. We expend a lot of effort on that. Um, but we don't do as well as we ought to in retaining those units, and we believe having dedicated commissioners assigned to them that are building a unit service plan from the beginning will help in that. We also think it will help in saving and, and rebuilding units that are at risk. And commissioner tools and the plan and the way it's architected in commissioner tools gives us a mechanism to identify units at risk. And we think those are units that are scoring 2.5 or below on assessments. Um, and we think that just like new units, units at risk ought to have dedicated commissioners so that we're sure that we have open communication with unit leaders, we've identified the needs, we've got a plan, and we're working the plan so that we can reduce the number of dropped units, whether they're new units, relatively new units, or whether they're units that have been around a period of time but are just having, having a difficult period. Um, so, so we really see this need for dedicated commissioners with both new units and units at risk, greater emphasis on placing commissioners where they can have the greatest impact rather than achieving a, a ratio of three to one. Um, and candidly, where we may have districts that don't have an adequate number of commissioners, we all working in districts know where the super troops and packs and crews are. They may not need the kind of support from commissioners that new units and unit units at risk do, so we focus our, our unit commissioner resources where the greatest need is and where they can have the greatest impact. So if you flip slides, slides for me, Deb. So at the end of the day, the unit service plan is, is focused on this concept of impact, and it's really involved with just four things, and they're the four that Rick talked about earlier, supporting unit growth through the journey to excellence, contacting units and capturing their strengths and needs and commissioner tools so we can build that plan, linking the unit needs to district operating committee resources. And if all of those things are working the way we want them to, it will also support timely charter renewal. And there are just three goals anymore for unit service, unit retention, unit contacts, and we talked about those in a little bit more detail, and unit performance, how many of our units are achieving some level of JTE status. The unit service plan built in commissioner tools supports all four of those things, all three of those goals. And as a result, it enables our commissioners to work more efficiently, more effectively, and for unit service to have greater impact. And that's a quick flyby of the unit service plan and how we would like to see it being used by our commissioners. And with that, I think we've got time left to do some questions. Well, thank you, Larry. Uh, Deborah, have you received any questions in a written form yet? Uh, I've given you all the questions that I have received, except one, which doesn't really have to do with the unit service plan. So okay. I answered that one off. Okay. 
So um, while um, we're taking a pause for a moment, folks, this is an opportunity. If you have a question, I think the easiest way to be heard is to send a note uh, to Deborah or Larry or myself uh, directly. If you think it's something that everybody should get the answer to, why don't you send it to all, and um, we'll all see that question as well. And uh, Deborah, while we're waiting a minute or two there, um, I thought you might want to take a moment since last month and uh, ask you, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot, I apologize, but is there anything new that you want to tell people about with regards to things that have happened in Commissioner Tools? Uh, for instance, there was a, a minor change this past couple days. Actually, um, with it, there may even be a new change that you're not aware of, Rick. And that is that uh, we've been working on the reports. And we know that there have been issues with the reports. Please um, understand that what we're trying to do is doing it in steps. And we know it's not perfect, so we ask your patience. But what we did was um, we split the reports that needed to be split into 2014 and 2015. When we did that, the reports became basically unusable. So we took them offline and we uh, tweaked them, um, basically improved performance. And as of tonight, we put those, all those reports back online for you. Uh, just I do want to caution you about the reports that if you are in a very large council that the reports, for example, I was testing with Salt Lake City. The reports did run, but it takes a long time for the report to totally populate, uh, meaning you're waiting for to be able to get to the bottom to get to your Excel button. So my recommendation, until we can put pagination in where you're able to page through one at a time, and we are working on that, but until you, we get to that, I'd recommend that you try running your reports at the district levels unless you're a smaller council. Well, thank you very much. So we've got one question that's come into all, and um, I'm going to start with an answer there, but I'm going to ask Larry um, if he might want to talk a little bit about it because it's, it's a really good segue from Al's question to Larry's presentation on the uh, unit service plan. Uh, the question, of course, as you can see there, is how are unit needs as identified in a detailed unit assessment communicated to district operating committee members? And um, the next parts of that are do the district committee chair or committee members have access commissioner tools? I'll answer that part. And the answer is no, they don't unless they're registered as a commissioner. And that might happen, say, um, in uh, units and um, uh, other places where people are multiple registered. So uh, it's possible, but not officially. So um, uh, Larry, do you want to answer that first part about how we communicate that? Yep. Um, the, the concept is that the unit commissioner will, in some fashion, reach out to the district operating committee um, and gain that commitment. And we did not we intentionally did not try to define how that will work because when you when you talk with people from councils across the country, you very quickly find that there are some areas in which people say, oh, that needs to come from the unit commissioner to the ADC, to the DC, across to the district chair, down to the vice chair of camping, boom, 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 boom. Um, and you have other councils where people say, John knows that Bill is the camping guy and he's just going to pick up the phone and call him. Um, so it can work in any one of a number of different ways, but yeah, we do see the um, unit commissioner having responsibility working through whatever the appropriate channels are in his or her district to make that contact and gain that commitment. Um, Rick's statement is absolutely accurate, but it's also important to remember that our professionals do have access to commissioner tools, and they too can see um, units that are new units, units that are at risk, what kinds of unit service plans are out there, and there's a capability in the detailed assessment to flag 
units with priority needs of, of various types, and those will fall out on a report that's available to administrative and district commissioner. Um, so yes, it is the unit commissioner's responsibility to, to make that contact through whatever is appropriate in his or her district, but there are other ways that that information can be shared as well built into commissioner tools. Thank you, Larry. Folks, do we have any other questions right now? We have a Raise question from Stephen Wells, and the question is, how do you get commissioner tools to send out emails to units to do self-assessment? Go get them, Rick. Okay. Thank you. So listen carefully here, because this is, um, it doesn't go out to the whole unit. But when you assign or set up a contact to occur in the future, so it's a future date, you have the ability to send a notice to the unit's leaders, the key three, and you select them individually, and an email will be generated which you will be blind copied on. Now, this is a little bit of an opportunity to accidentally, in an effort to do good, actually make things a little more complicated for yourself if you don't begin this process by first communicating with the unit. I really am begging everybody, don't surprise people with an email saying you set up an opportunity to meet in the future, whether it's in a week, a month, or whatever. Instead, talk to them first and then go through that process. So let me repeat that. When you go to set up your contact and you select a future date, you have the option of making that a collaborative assessment and sending an invitational email to members of the key three whom you get to select individually, and you can blind copy other individuals, say somebody has multiple email addresses they want to use, just separated by a semicolon, and you'll get a blind copy as well. So when you select those individuals and schedule that contact in that fashion, they will be then sent an email, as will you, with a hyperlink in it that allows them to go do that unit assessment portion online. Um, Dave Fornadel is also reminding me, there's a good video on the website that tells you just how to do that. Have we gotten any other questions, Deborah? No other questions. Okay. Well, folks, there's a way to raise your hand. If you're trying to communicate and you're not figuring out how to do that, uh, there are a bunch of icons up in the upper left-hand corner. Mine says raise hand, but there are other choices, happy face and okay, go faster, go slower, applause, et cetera. If you're trying to reach out to us and can't do that um, for some reason, that's one way you can alert us to the fact that you've got something going on, raise your hand or, or something along those lines. So while we're waiting, I did tell you that um, I would tease you a little bit about what some of our future Commissioner Tools virtual forums topics are planned to be. Uh, we're working right now to talk about training in September. And our guest presenters, one of whom is on the phone tonight, is uh, uh, Dave Fornadel. And uh, also Bob Hoffmeyer has agreed that he would, oh, Bob's on too, he would uh, uh, present next month. So that's our plan for September 10th, and we're aiming for October 8th to have a topic and a session devoted to reports. And hopefully by then our reports will all be running lightning fast, and then uh, that issue won't be one of the key uh, concepts and uh, uh, significant part of our discussion that evening. If you don't mind, I'd like to take just a minute to identify the fact that um, for those folks who are not aware that uh, we have posted on the landing page on my.scouting that we have launched the ability to take e-learning in the new tools. This is really important because as of today, you can still take e-learning in the old system, but literally in the next few days, we are going to be shutting down the legacy or the existing myscouting.org e-learning. And we're going to be directing everyone to take their training in the new tools. 
And the way you do that is you click on that My Dashboard, and it will bring up My Training. And it will give you the ability to take all of your training there to see what training is required for your position, to see what training you've already taken, and also it has a separate tab just for your youth protection training. Well, Deborah, if we don't have any more questions, um, I remember somewhere along the line with all my training with regards to meetings and uh, if there's no reason for having a meeting, then you shouldn't have the meeting. And I think a corollary to that is if the meeting ends early, you should end early rather than just drag it out. So I'm, I'm going to propose that we do a last call for questions, and if there are none, then we uh, end this uh, a couple minutes early. Oh, well, wait a minute. Come in. <laughs> Can you describe how to update the unit service plan after an initial detailed collaborative assessment? So I think that's going to have two parts to it. I'll let Larry start because there's a technical part which we'll, we've actually discussed a little bit about as well, but that's for future. But uh, why don't I let Larry talk a little bit about the, the, the philosophy and the process itself. When I was talking about the unit service plan, I mentioned the term meaningful contact and that that was considered to be a contact that moved the plan forward, helped the unit progress along its journey to excellence. Um, and the most common tool that we have for documenting a unit contact is the simple assessment. Um, Rick will typically say that a simple assessment can be entered in 90 seconds or less, um, and that really is, is an accurate assessment. It can be done very, very quickly because it simply amounts to um, setting up a contact, accessing simple assessment, giving a rating of 1 to 5 to the unit, and then making a quick comment about what specifically is the, was the reason for the contact and the result. So the simple assessment is probably the best possible tool to use for updating the plan. Um, there may be occasions in which an intermediate assessment, which is done within the detailed assessment function, may be a better tool just because of the magnitude of what's being covered, but the simple assessment probably works the majority of the time. Um, I did not mention it specifically when talking about the plan, but the, the concept behind the plan is that a detailed assessment will be done about every six months, twice a year, um, and perhaps a third time if there's a significant change that occurs at the unit, for example, change in leadership. Thank you, Larry. Now, to that I will also add that um, we have three subgroups that uh, are part of the Commissioner Tools Focus Group and Subgroup 2 looks at enhancements and future releases. And uh, one of the things that we have discussed is something that would basically uh, pre-populate uh, a future collaborative assessment with prior information. Um, and, and it's an idea. We haven't fleshed this out entirely, but it's one of those things that we've talked about with regards to would that be a benefit, how would that work, and that way people wouldn't have to uh, maybe re-key information that's already there. So uh, it, it's not firmed up or anything, but we're looking at some ideas to try and make people's lives a little easier. That, that's just a detail, though. De Gary, Larry, I'm sorry, Larry, I keep mi mixing up your name. Larry gave you the important parts there. Well, Deborah, I haven't seen any other questions after William, so um, perhaps uh, this is an appropriate time to uh, thank everyone and uh, wrap it up for the evening. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you participating. And thank you, Larry, and I uh, worked hard on uh, not mispronouncing your name this time. <laughs>